Namaskar and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Ayer and today I have with me Pandit Satish Kumar Sharma ji from United Kingdom. Pandit ji, namaskar and welcome to P Guru's channel. Pranam Sri ji, namaskar ji, good morning. Om Guru Bhyo Namaha. It's lovely to see you here today. And and the feeling is mutual sir. We want to take a quick look at what has been happening in the United Kingdom and uh, this this farmer stir and then the greater gate that we talked about uh, in our last hangout looks like it is still lingering around it is getting uh, you know taking a life of its own with the arrest of disha ravi and a lot of things have been happening how are things over at uh, united kingdom because i know that this thing is now become like a pan world phenomenon and you know everything happens in sync synchronization you have india and then sweden and then united kingdom and then rihana in the united states and and in few people in canada so how are things over in the united kingdom uh it's a a very difficult situation to talk about uh, in detail but i'll try and share a few issues you mentioned greater gate and you're absolutely right that has really opened the lid on forget a can of worms this is a huge industrial sized dustbin of worms and it's it's revealed that some of those worms have taken up residence and become firmly installed into the british establishment there is uh, more than enough evidence now to be able to assert that we have people here in the united kingdom tragically many of them most of them aligned with or a part of the labor party who are adamant that they are going to interfere in india's democratic affairs but the manner in which they're doing it causes a great deal of concern they're stoking up and i would go as far as to say that many of them making comments and remarks which could be deemed to be inciting they are adding fuel to um kindling which is already being ignited by other people and this is happening more and more we've had um commentators here who have potentially introduce the communal angle now i know that uh, none of us wanted to introduce a communal angle to this this is nothing to do with religion or to do with uh, dharmic traditions or anything like that this is to do with legislation affecting the pricing and the distribution of agricultural product in a nation of uh, 1.2 billion people and it's a democratic process so anybody who ventures into introducing a communal angle i think is really um treading on eggshells they're going to be harming us so yes it's uh, it's getting worse it seems to be out of control here and um i think the labor mp's really do need to reconsider their positions and their perspectives um satish ji i was watching some of the horrific videos where the delhi police which was acting with remarkable restraint they actually jumped into a 10 foot deep moat in order to ward the blows seek uh, you know sticks and i think hockey sticks were also i saw some and and some rods even and and the police were completely restrained in fact the last figure that i know of is i think 300 delhi policemen were hurt and some of them i believe landed on their head when they jumped into the moat that can be you know serious injuries i mean in in terms of how the police acted they acted with remarkable restraint they did they, they were very very you know mild they they didn't do anything at that point of time even though you know you, why would somebody go and fly the flag on the red fort and that to a sikh religious flag and and all that was orchestrated some say that it was not the original uh, people who were connected with the agitation that did that be that as it may but what the world saw was remarkable restraint and yet these fans keep flaming and i'm really aghast so do we have some sort of a video that we can show to our viewers uh yes in fact i've managed to get one video of uh, a commentator here who has been deliberately trying to introduce the sikh hindu element into this and uh, if you play the clip now you'll have an opportunity to see how clearly he does this Well, joining us now are the president of the Hindu Forum of Britain, Tripti Patel, and Sunny Hundal, a political commentator who writes for the online blog Open Democracy. Welcome to you both, Tripti. Uh, can I start Namaste. by asking you? Good evening. Um, 
the Prime Minister is obviously paying quite a price to try and get these reforms through. What, what's the benefit? What's the, what's the prize as far as the government is concerned? It's not just the government. Uh, this reform has been needed for a, for a long period of time. And previous governments actually commissioned um, the, Swam the Swaminathan Committee and various other committees where it came out that how can we make sure that our farmers um, actually do better than what they've been uh, subjected to? Uh, how can they uh, come out of the poverty trap? How can they come out of not being in the shackles of the um, agriculture uh, produced mondays? Uh, that you mentioned earlier on. So long before um, the, the, the present um, Indian government started the, started, started the government, uh, it was actually in the pipeline. And many states actually made those rules so that, for example, uh, if we look at um, uh, if Pepsi, Pepsi company wanted um, potatoes for the crisp, or if um, uh, any other like wine for the beer or any, any other commodities, there, are, there were certain rules, but everything was shackled, shackled in terms of very rigid regulations. And when you look around the world, when you look at the agriculture laws of this country, modernization is required to meet the need of the other. And modernization is something that should be helpful to everyone. And this is what the these laws are. So if you look back, even there are right. uh, there, there, there are um, newspaper clippings, there are video recordings of the many people who are actually objecting to these laws now. So Sunny Hunda, let's, let's bring not, Sunny in here, not, Tripti. Uh, unexceptional in the sense that it's intended to improve productivity, take Indian agriculture into the modern age. So why is it uh, politically dangerous, do you think, for Narendra Modi to, to press ahead with this? Uh, good evening. I mean, look, it's a bit like, I think, putting a corner shop next to Tesco and saying to them, you know, go and compete against each other. There's no doubt that with India's, uh, you know, farm laws and its whole agriculture system needs modernization. But the problem is most people who are farmers in India, and I think there's an uh, there's a strong UK connection here because you have to remember there's 500,000 Punjabis in this country and they have very strong family links to Punjab. That's why they're angry about these uh, issues. The problem is that you're putting these small businessmen and saying to them, go and compete and work with these giant multinationals. And what's going to happen? What they're going to do is they're going to squeeze the small farmers. And I think that's the biggest worry for a lot of them in India. And that's why actually there's been so much interest of, on this issue, even in the UK, because, uh, you know, like I said, there's a, five, there's a half a million Punjabis in this country, in Canada, in the United States. And all these people have family links to what's going on in India. They're interested in, uh, you know, the political affairs over there, but they're interested in what their families, uh, how they're being affected by this whole situation. And most farmers across the country are saying, this is going to be bad for us. You're putting us at the mercy of multinational corporations. Tripti, that, that's got to be a point, hasn't it? People will just be rolled under the steamroller of big agribusiness uh, once these well, uh, traditional protections are removed. Well, if, if, if you think about it, there are 100, over 100 million farmers in India. And how many are protesting? See, what, what you've got to look at it as well is that it's not just the Punjabis who have got the links to the farming. There are, there are Gujaratis, there are Biharis, there are Kashmiris. There are all sorts of Indians. All over Indians living in this country have farming roots in India. So, so it is not fair to actually say that only Punjabis. And if you look at the whole situation, out of 100 million farmers, if um, less than a percent, one percent are actually um, talking against it, then there is some, some concern. And the government actually talked to them 11 times. Uh, and uh, the, the, the argument being put forward is that you've got to repeal this first. Now you tell me first, uh, is there any government in the world that is, uh, when they put a law in with both houses of the parliament without any objections or obstructions, uh, with all proper process followed, then how can a handful of people say that repeal this law? No, the best thing is really to sit down together, to mediate together, right. to go point by point 
and remove those points that you don't like it. Uh, it, it there is no agitation is okay, but you need to you need to negotiate to achieve something. And it's not in the interest of the comp your country or people or people living abroad like all of us. Sunny, um, to actually let me bring you in. Let, uh, sorry, sorry, Tripti, but just picking up on your last point about the need to sit down and negotiate, I just wondered to what extent the intercommunal uh, dynamic of this is going to complicate those negotiations because it's obvious looking at the footage that a lot of Sikhs are involved in this protest. Uh, uh, and I wondered to what extent that community feels that these laws are working particularly against their interests. Well, it's not just Sikhs who are uh, uh, getting involved in these protests. They've been protests all over the country from the south to the east to the west and the north where Punjab is. But, you know, actually what's happening over there is going to have a huge impact over here as well. And that's because, you know, what, what the government is doing now is trying to make this into a Sikh protest and say that these people are being led by extremists and they're Sikhs and they're trying to take the government into, you know, uh, ruin the government. And what it's doing is it's turning this whole issue into a Sikhs versus Hindu issue as a way to delegitimize the protests. And that's dangerous because, like I said, there's 500,000 Sikhs in this country, there's 500,000 Hindus in this country. Do you, do you fear country. violence in this and country, some... Sunny, as a result of this? Yes. If there's violence in India, there's going to be violence in this country. That's what worries me. And I think that we, as the government here, have a duty to tell the Indian government to calm down some of its rhetoric because it's really hate speech over there and it's really dangerous. Uh, final answer, Tripti. Fair point there from Sunni. A, a need to cool this atmosphere now? Well, absolutely, in a sense that you need to talk. Both sides need to come on the table. Both sides need to start talking sense. Okay, I I don't think that in this country we work on on a on an interfaith level. We work on a local level, regional level. We work with the Hindu Sikh community is not separated because if you if you look back the roots the roots is in in this Anatan Vedic culture as we call it on the subcontinent. So I can't see that um, the two communities could be at the loggerhead. What we need sorry, to make... it's not true. It's actually really? happening. It's already been happening over the last four All years. Right. Since no, what we need to make sure... The may I finish, please? Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. I'm sorry, we've got may to I end it there. Please? Sunny Handal, Tripti Patel, I'm so sorry. We've just got to yeah, end it there. We We're should, out of we time. That's very, very grim, Satish ji. And... Uh, they, if, if there's one thing that I can I can say that you know Sikhs are we Hindus yes there have been some communication issues not because of the entire community but because of some and that happened many many years ago now and uh, I, I, I all I can say is very unfortunate there has to be a conversation now because there is a concerted very determined group who want to create a rift between the Hindu and the Sikh community. Okay? The majority of people, both on the Hindu side and the Sikh side, are absolutely adamantly clear that we are brothers. We're brothers and sisters, and there is absolutely no desire for this rift to be uh, expanded and made, made wider. But I think the conversation now needs to be had, and uh, Hindu leaders need to step up and, uh, and have this conversation. I'm really heartened by seeing many Sikh commentators express remorse at the desecration of the Republic Day event, because that was actually India celebrating a democracy. It was celebrating its appearance on the world stage as, the, as a modern iteration of its ancient democratic principles. And to desecrate that is an attack on the Indian state. It's an attack on the democratic processes. And there's no room for that. And if um, this uh, group who proudly present themselves as Khalistanis um, felt that they were justified in attacking the Indian state. That's, uh, as far as I'm concerned, that's an act of treason. It's an act against the Republic. And there will be increasingly voices that demand um, justice and that demand democracy being protected. As you say, I totally agree. The Indian, the Delhi police responded with remarkable restraint. Um, and, you know, one has to remember that we shouldn't dehumanize them by just calling them Dili police. There were fathers there, there were brothers, sisters, mothers, there were people there. One officer lost his life, and that impact on the, the family is a very real impact. And so it's a cause for shame that this would have happened. 
on Republic Day or at any time. And wise heads do, do need to step in and, uh, and dampen these feelings down. Here in the UK, I've noticed, uh, as we've seen from that clip, numerous attempts and calls to make this into a Hindu Sikh issue. And the Hindu community leaders have absolutely resisted it. And I know many, many Sikh leaders who have also said, no, we do not want this to go there. It's not of our concern. It's to do with India. And fine, there are farmers who have family over here, but we should participate in the issue democratically. You should, if you are going to um, resist, if you are going to protest, then it must be done within democratic uh, processes. As you and I know, the the people who were driving those tractors and attacking the police officers with those tractors, they deviated from the agreed routes. Originally, it was not going to be on the 26th, but the government acceded and said, okay, fine, if you want to have it on the 26th when all of the world's cameras are on New Delhi, then so be it, we'll accommodate that. That was so such an accommodation when you think of the security arrangements that go around the public day. And that was an extension. That shows you how the hand of friendship and tolerance and uh, uh, openness was extended to the protesters, the genuine protesters. But to deviate from the agreed paths and to take tractors and swords into an area where the Republic Day celebrations are focused, that is an act uh, of violence against the state and the people. And um, I don't think the Indian government would find many critics if it responded with the harshness that is necessary to show that the law has to be defended, the law has to be upheld, and it and sentences and criminality will pursue. So this is uh, both an opportunity and a tragedy. Uh, we really do hope that the uh, Indian government uh, acts on both counts. And uh, let's uh, quickly take a look at um, what has been happening as a follow-up to the, uh, the incident of the arrest of uh, Disha Ravi. I'm hearing that the Labour Party MPs are now uh, starting to uh, get into an uproar of sorts and misrepresenting facts. And uh, this has been happening even in the United States. However, in the United States, one good thing that happened was the White House legal department sort of put a kibosh on Meena, I should say Meenakshi Harris, uh, the niece of Vice President Kamala Devi Harris. And she has kind of gone quiet for a little bit. Hopefully that's going to stay and then more temperate remarks will come out. Everybody has their opinion. Everybody's free to express their opinion, but just don't do it on uh, false news. Um, Satish ji, um, how are things over in uh, United Kingdom? Because the way I see it, sir, is this, this movement, uh, something that has been funded by a hidden hand and, and this seems to be permeating across multiple countries, same kind of a playbook and simultaneous eruption of fake outrage. And uh, it seems to be like uh, when something happens in India that is, seems to be favorable, the same thing starts reverberating more in England and in the United States. And the recent reason is that since a Democrat is in power in the White House, now therefore, uh, the Labour Party in the United Kingdom appears to have found second win, and, and there are some noises coming out of there. What's your experience, sir? The analysis that you put forward, that this is a pan-national phenomenon, 100%. Um, in fact, the evidence from the United Kingdom would support that, and uh, some of the things that you've mentioned, we, we would really like to see here. I was uh, quite impressed at the manner in which Mina Harris's uh, totally ill-considered remarks were very quickly um, cut short and she was brought to toe the line. Um, the administration recognized that this was going to harm relationships between the US and India and they brought her into line. She was completely out, speaking out of turn. We do have one issue and that is that the, the Labour leadership, Keir Starmer, seems to have absolutely no control over these um, parliamentarians who are relics from the Jeremy Corbyn days. Um, the image of somebody trying to have a large basket and put kittens underneath it and keep them under control. You know, it's an old analogy that we use to, to explain to children. Well, this is how the Labour Party is at the moment. Keir Starmer is desperately trying to get these juvenile kittens who keep squeezing out and running out and um, re wreaking havoc all over the place. They have no respect for the boundaries that democratic states operate under. A democracy is built upon the notion that the majority come to a, a solution 
and we deem that solution to be wiser because it's refined and expressed by a majority and then that has to be respected whereas if you feel that you have some sort of authority to criticize the democratic process of another country that's fine but the moment you transgress that boundary into interference into inciting people into acts of violence and uh, illegality then that needs to be restrained and there is no evidence of Keir Starmer having the capacity to do that in fact that's one of the largest disappointments i think the british indian hindu community are feeling with regard to labor um it's like a, a ship where the, the youngsters are running amok nobody is pulling the reins nobody is building a consensus nobody is determining what's right and what's wrong and what's policy and what isn't policy you may recall that there was a, an engagement right at Keir Starmer's um, uh, commencement of his term of leadership where he engaged with the Hindu community and made it quite clear that in fact the Labour Party did not have um, the authority and it wasn't going to interfere in places where it had no um, legal um, or, or positive contribution. But we've seen very recently our dear friend Dhanmanjit Desi from Slough in the House of Commons making the most outrageous remarks. Um, we've seen this notion of 250 million being touted all the time. Um, 250 million, the, the population of, I think, London is about 60 million or something like that. And it's just a, a nonsense figure plucked out of the air, presented on the floor of the chamber with no, no evidence at all. And it's not just Keir, other parliamentarians are doing the same. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, you know, this uh, is something that even I was, uh, you know, uh, brought, uh, it was brought to my attention also. Uh, in fact, my near and dear kith and kin actually pointed it out to me that uh, uh, 250 million farmers are suffering. And when I asked them to show the, score, the story, then they showed me 10 stories. And then I had to <laughs> sit them down and explain what is syndication, what is new syndication, and that... It's very easy for one lie to get propagated over and over because the verb, verbiage was almost identical. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so, but you know, parliamentarians, parliamentarians are required to check the facts. You know, normal people who um, perhaps are not so diligent, perhaps don't carry so much responsibility, they can be sloppy with uh, circulating uh, opinions like. 250 million but parliamentarians have to be held to a higher standard and uh, so Satishji I came across an article that said that uh, Claudia Webb actually yeah. uh, got into a bit of a pickle in terms of uh, uh, receiving funding I'm not totally clear about what happened something about a place called Islington I think or it, it's Arlington. <laughs> I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing it right. Can you give us an update? Because I know she is also one of those eager beavers, uh, you know, uh, quick to comment about things that are happening in India. Yes, um, Claudia Webb is our favorite uh, MP who was parachuted into Leicester um, in complete defiance of all democratic processes. And she has leapt from frying pans into the fire, into all sorts of... Uh, completely ridiculous situations and most recently um, yes as you say she has uh, fallen foul of the regulators in Parliament if you're an MP you're required to register income and monies that you receive and as I've mentioned before um, she is an Islington politician who was parachuted into the safe seat of Leicester um, which I think is an act of contempt. It shows incredible contempt for the uh, labor activists in Leicester who have been working for 20, 30, 40 years, that uh, the, uh, the senior, the bigwigs in the Labour Party thought not one of them was worth nominating as an MP from the locality itself. Instead, they took advantage of the loyalty of those Labour voters and parachuted Claudia into there. But she is still an Islington person. And um, she is still very much active in Islington, as we mentioned last time. But what she was doing was receiving remuneration from Islington Council for her role as a councillor. And she did not register that. And, you know, that is a level of competence. It's a basic level of competence that a person in that position should be able to display. It doesn't take more than a few minutes to tick a few boxes and make sure that it's on the register. That's it. Done. 
and yet she didn't do that. Now we've got, um, if you step back for a moment and do a bit of political analysis, here's what I think is happening. Jeremy Corbyn has had his day and his shot at being the leader of the Labour Party. And it's only a question of time before he steps down as the MP for Islington. Okay. Now, when that happens, Claudia is being groomed to take over from Jeremy Corbyn. So this is the long-term plan that uh, the, the extreme left seem to be executing. But her level of incompetence is now becoming a major source of embarrassment. In fact, um, if I share with you um, her Twitter feed, sure. perhaps we can see an example of some of the difficulties that she faces. So this is uh, February the 16th, you know, Webb in trouble again because she didn't declare her councillor income. And if we have a look at some of the other posts that uh, we have, this is the MP for Leicester, councillor for Islington, and yet you will notice that her major concern are the farmers' protest, and she goes on in detail about it. Then she talks about the Sharavi. So this is a Leicester MP who is intimately clued in to this Disharavi situation. It makes one wonder, was she actually a part of this Greta Gate? Was she on the list of these people who were groomed and primed to attack the Indian state? One really um, has to, to ask these questions. Yes, uh, and as a matter of fact, the Indian government has... Uh, um, Satish, just hold that uh, screen for a minute. The mm -hmm. Indian government has, uh, in fact, asked Zoom to share the details of all the participants of that one conference call where this whole thing was planned, Disharavi, and then there is a person called Nikita Jacob, who is actually, I believe, in hiding right now. Not mm, sure yes. if that person has been apprehended. And then, of course, there is Greta. Uh, and, and then there are a whole bunch of other people. And all this is now starting to come tumbling out of the closet. And there is also a bigger um, conspiracy, I don't know, a bigger uh, nexus at work. And, and that part, I'm waiting. I know a little bit more, but I'm hesitant to share it without <clears throat> having the complete uh, data on my, in my hand. So I perhaps we can do it in the next uh, hangout. Yeah. So please continue, sir. No, it's a, it's a question of competence, really. And it's also a question of uh, humility. Right? The Labour Party is supposed to be the party of democracy representing the average working man on the street. And their alliances are supposed to be with the farmers and the Annadatta, you know, all of these are very virtuous causes that you can espouse. But there is a, a precondition, that is that you respect a democracy. It's not democracy when it suits us, but we're against a democratically um, uh, elected government because we have got other issues and other targets. This is, this is not how one uh, establishes a, a cordial relationship. And it's, being to, it's beginning to be felt in her own community. As you can see from these sorts of tweets, people are now beginning to complain. You know, she says that she has less than four hours sleep a day. Okay, so why is she being a counsellor in Islington? And why on earth is she tinkering around and dabbling in the affairs of uh, another uh, of the Indian state? It's just completely ridiculous. Uh, look at this as a tweet. This is only 11 hours ago. Hmm. The Indian government are abandoning 250 million Indian farmers to market forces. Okay, so again, four hours sleep. Um, we can see she's busy tweeting about the Indian issues all night. Uh, so here's some more. And her timeline is just filled with issues to do with uh, India and um, other nations. This tweet is quite uh, relevant because... She's also um, part of a criminal proceedings where she is accused of bullying um, a, particular, uh, a particular woman and uh, harassing her with uh, uh, aggressive calls. And Westminster Magistrates Court is looking at this case right now at this moment in time. And you can see poll after poll, people are saying, well, why on earth is she doing this? Why on earth is she dabbling? in the farm, 100 million farmers, 250 million farmers, etc. Here's a, an interesting development, which um, I'd like to bring to your attention. Mm -hmm. So this is the Indian government. Our local high commission have actually sent a letter to um, this particular MP and also to Tanmanji. They've written to them. 
it's great from one point of view that the High Commission have realised that they do have to speak from time to time and participate at this level. We've been encouraging them to do that for a long time. What is really disappointing, though, is the tone, the demeanour, and the, the manner in which the letter has been constructed. We have a phrase, um, commanding respect. Right? It doesn't, the phrase is not that one sort of um, begs for respect. It, it doesn't happen. But this letter does not command respect. It's hugely disappointing. So this is the letter to Claudia Webb, and it starts off as excellency. Now, why on earth would anybody refer to a parliamentarian as excellency? That's a, a complete um, breach of protocol. But apart from that, it's ingratiating. It's sort of um, begging bowl colonialist mentality that uh, you know one has to appeal to her. One has to give her facts. Whereas really the person who's in the wrong is Claudia. Uh, I have a question or a clarification. How would be uh, a member of parliament addressed? Is, what is the proper way to address this person? Okay, so if it's a conventional member of parliament, and uh, remember, Claudia is a relatively junior person in all of these things. Okay, she is a member of parliament, an MP, and so she is the Honourable Claudia Webb, having had a look at the cases of alleg and the allegations against her. Um, Honourable is uh, a word that will probably be put into inverted commas when using uh, this word to refer to Claudia. If a person is on the front bench or of ministerial rank, then they become right honourable. And that's, that's it, in a nutshell. Nothing more than that. So had this letter been addressed to the Honourable Ms. Claudia Webb, that would have been sufficient. But excellency is wholly inappropriate. It's, you know, excellency is for ambassadors and uh, people in the diplomatic. I was going to sphere. say that, yeah. 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 Right. Um, right. But it's just the, the tone of this letter is educative as opposed to politically um, stable. There is no command of the authority and there's no leveraging of the, uh, the, the position of respect that the Indian government has in this issue. It shouldn't be apologetic. It has completely complied with democratic processes. Um, it's a democratically elected government. There is no reason why the High Commissioner to the um, Republic of India would be wanting to present and give account for the actions of the government to Claudia Webb from Leicester. Uh, there is something not quite right in this, and um, I, I really do hope I get an opportunity to have a chat with the High Commissioner uh, on these sorts of issues. It's wholly inappropriate. But as you can see, there is a huge amount of interference going on in the UK with what's going on in the United States. And I think Keir Starmer should mm. really reflect mm. upon the fact that we have local council elections now coming up in May. They should have been held last year, but they were obviously deferred because of the COVID crisis. But in May of this year, local councils are holding the elections. And it would be very interesting to see how Leicester's Indian Hindu community decide to hold accountable their elected Labour representatives. And uh, uh, if you are done with this screen, could you come back to full screen, sir? Ah, OK. Thank you. Um, so there's also uh, a mayoral election for London, isn't it? Uh, Mayor Sadiq Khan, is he contesting again or is it going to be somebody else uh, uh, running from the Labour ticket? What What's happening on that? Wonderful thought, yes. Uh, the mayoral election has been announced. Um, Sadiq Khan's hat is in the ring. And um, we do have a conservative contender. Um, Sean Bailey is a gentleman's name, a man of African origin. And there is a great deal of support behind the Conservative candidate. It'll be interesting to see because London is one of those metropolitan areas where the Labour, the left, um, have always been very, very strong. Although Sadiq Khan has never had such a low showing in terms of his ratings, there is a great deal of dissatisfaction. Now, I would go as far as to say that in many quarters there's a great deal of anger and resentment uh, the manner in which London has declined, the quality of life in London has declined, the security in London has declined under his mayorship. And so there's a great deal of um, dissatisfaction, but Labour has always been very strong in London. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Uh, his personal credentials are pretty much non-existent. I think we will see um, the true loyalty that the Labour leadership commands in London. We'll see the loyalty of Labour followers who might be party 
supporters and would vote for Labour in a conventional sense, but they might decide, well, hang on, we've had enough of this Labour mayor and it's time for a change of the uh, of the mayor. It's a, a completely volatile situation, very difficult to call. But I would suggest that unless Sadiq does something completely inappropriate, and he's done one or two things, um, there's a, uh, tragically a good chance that he may well be uh, re-elected as mayor. Well, um, you know, this is a democracy, and I think people have to see who best serves their interests, and we'll have to just wait and see. And uh, Panditji, thanks for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, have this uh, hangout with me. And as always, it's a pleasure. And we are, viewers will be back again with more news from uh, United Kingdom. Until then, goodbye, namaskar, and see you soon. Pranam Sriji, a pleasure as always. I look forward to our next outing. Thank you, sir. Thank you.